Our Eye on America investigation of drugs, guns, and money laundering in Arkansas in the 1980s. By 1988, law enforcement officials investigating the case had given up on the federal government, pinning their hopes for prosecution on the state judicial system. Correspondent Bill Plant picks up the story from there. By 1988, almost everyone in Arkansas had heard about MENA. It was here at Rich Mountain Aviation that authorities believed Barry Seal moved his operation. There were news reports about smuggling and Contra support activity around the MENA airport. Congress had begun an inquiry, and the media covered it all. At the Polk County Courthouse in MENA, Trooper Welch and Agent Duncan turned to County Prosecutor Charles Black for help. And when it became apparent that uh, nothing was going to be done on the federal level, that's when I began more actively pursuing it. Prosecutor Black, a Clinton supporter, met with the governor and handed him a letter requesting money for a state grand jury on MENA. His response to me was that he would uh, uh, get a man, something to the effect that he would get a man on it and would get word back to me. And uh, I never heard back. Years later, Clinton yeah, said he offered $25,000 to Prosecutor Black's to boss to, to fund a grand jury. But Charles Black and his boss claim they never heard about any offer of money from Governor Clinton. I believe Bill Clinton's an honest, respectable man, and I have to believe that he did that. But the fact is, I never got that word myself. But the MENA issue would not die. I don't think that the story of Iran-Contra has yet been fully told. In 1988, Arkansas Congressman Bill Alexander asked the General Accounting Office to investigate connections between the MENA airport Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North's Contra operations, and Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. Alexander says the National Security Council, in this letter, refused to cooperate, challenging GAO's authority, and effectively killing the investigation. Then MENA became an issue in the 1990 Attorney General's race in Arkansas between Republican Asa Hutchinson and Democrat Winston Bryant. Sources tell CBS News that Governor Clinton's aide, Betsy Wright, asked Bryant to stay away from the MENA issue. Wright denies it. In 1991, Congressman Alexander got the Arkansas State Police a federal grant to reopen the MENA investigation. Sources tell CBS News that Governor Clinton's staff was involved in the discussions about what to do with that grant. The money went to State Police Chief Tommy Goodwin. That money was discussed around here for quite a while, <laughs> and, and we finally said, we'll just turn it back. We don't have any things to spend it on. Well, what happened to the state case? Nothing happened to the state case. A grand jury was never called. Uh, uh, it just it just died. I maintained uh, a certain amount of faith that at some point the problem would be solved. That never occurred. Has not occurred. Has yet. not occurred to this date. Barry Seal's organization helped the Contras, smuggled tons of cocaine, and laundered drug profits through Arkansas. Why did the Reagan Justice Department fail to prosecute? Did Bill Clinton, then the governor, fail to provide leadership and support for a successful state prosecution? The White House says he did all he could. But Agent Duncan, Trooper Welts, Prosecutor Black, and a lot of other people are still looking for answers. In Washington, this is Bill Plant for Eye on America. We begin tonight with the extraordinary story that has been unfolding about Panama's strongman, Manuel Antonio Noriega, and his links with the United States government. Noriega was indicted last week in Florida for involvement in international drug trafficking. He responded by threatening to remove U.S. troops from the Panama Canal Zone. For the past two days, a former Noriega aide has described an international criminal empire allegedly run by Noriega and his ties with U.S. officials. Judy Woodruff has the details. Jose Blandon, a former top political aide to Noriega, described what he called a criminal empire that involved private pilots, the Panamanian military, other government officials, private corporations, and banks. It was at the center of an alleged drug and gun running network throughout Central America. Blandone, who spoke in Spanish and English, also revealed that Noriega sold arms through this network to the Marxist rebel group known as the FMLN, fighting the U.S.-backed government of President Duarte in El Salvador. In 1980, after the Sandinista Revolution, we saw the beginning of uh, traffic of weapons from Panama and Costa Rica to El Salvador. 
These arms. Now, who who were these weapons being sold to in El Salvador? The weapons were being sold to the National Liberation Front, the FMLN in El Salvador, basically. And it was a group which at that time had millions of dollars in their hands because they had obtained those funds through kidnappings which they had carried out during a previous period. Now at the time, General Noriega had a close relationship with the United States, correct? Yes, of course. At the time, General Noriega was Chief of Military Intelligence in Panama. And he was working with the CIA, correct? Yes, he worked with the Central Intelligence Agency and with the Central Intelligence Agencies working in different branches of the U.S. Army stationed in Panama at the various military bases there. So while General Noriega was working with the CIA and being paid by us and had a close relationship, he was selling arms to the rebels that were fighting the government we were supporting. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. According to Blandone, Noriega also struck a deal with a group of notorious Colombian drug traffickers known as the Medellin Cartel, which he said paid Noriega between four and seven million dollars in protection money for a drug processing plant in Panama. At the same time, he was working with U.S. drug enforcement officials through a Panamanian who was a member of his alleged criminal empire. When they have a problem with someone who hasn't paid, then they turn him over to the DEA. So their work is to keep the DEA happy, giving those people that they do not want. Ah. And they usually turn in U.S. citizens involved in drug trafficking in the U.S., those that the DEA has an interest in. Ms. Blandon, it appears, if I could just interrupt you, I mean, it appears that uh, the cartel and General Noriega seem to know very, very well how to feed our criminal justice system, just little bits to keep it happy, but nothing real. Is that, uh, would you say that's a fair statement? I would say that it goes even further than that, Senator. If you look at the control with the Medellin cartel exercises over our defense forces and everything they know about the psychology, aspirations and interests of the officers in Panama, they know much more than what the U.S. knows about Panama's defense forces or any other defense forces in Latin America. We have a phenomenon here whereby there is a multinational force being created, one that is headed by drug traffickers and which controls power over Central American states. If I might, uh, and I think you, you made, made the point, uh, I congratulate you because it's important that we um, let the American people know, the Congress know, the administration, exactly what's been taking place. This is a charade, a giant charade. And as uh, you've indicated, Mr. Blandone has expanded upon the, this cartel understands the psychology of dealing with not only with the Panamanian Defense Forces, but certainly the political forces here in the United States. And they do, as you mentioned, just feed uh, when they have to some crumbs, and most of them are people who haven't cooperated in their drug dealing. Well, I want to ask one other area that's a short, small area and a very disturbing one. And I, you told me yesterday when we were talking um, that, that, that the CIA gave information to Noriega government, to Panamanian government officials on U.S. senators. Is that accurate? Is that true? As part of the political intelligence team in Panama, documents which were drafted in the area of political intelligence on individuals coming to Panama came to my hands, and the CIA did prepare reports. Did the NSC also prepare reports? Yes. Which you would receive? 
que yes, recibía Noriega y nos pasaba a nosotros. Recuerdo la misión que I recall, for example, la señorita Débora de Monte de antemano una información completa del perfil Complete information. de la misión. Deborah DeMoss, uh, for the record, is a staff member sitting beside me of Senator Helms. You had information about Senator Helms. Did you also have information about Senator Kennedy? También. Yes, also. Can you describe that? Información que expresaba We had information eh, to the effect uh, while well, stating his political position and his own personal problems. We had all types of information on him. And who provided you that information? The information came to my hands through Panamanian intelligence. It was classified information coming from the U.S. Were the documents U.S. documents? Yes, clearly. Were they marked classified? Yes, they were marked classified. Did you receive documents on any staff people of Senator Kennedy? Yes. Well, I, I, I don't even think it needs words or explanation or anything else. I think it's something we ought to inquire about further, but uh, it's about as disturbing a revelation as I've heard in the course of a lot of disturbing revelations over the course of the last year and a half. And, uh, well, we'll see where it goes. The CIA denied those allegations. Today, Blandone she told the senators that, another story. He said General office. Noriega was working with a man who became the central figure in the Iran-Contra scandal, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. He described a series of meetings, the first aboard a yacht off the Panamanian coast. During that meeting, the military situation in Nicaragua was discussed, as well as the regional situ situation. Colonel North was interested in gaining Panama's support for the Contras, and he particularly requested training assistance in bases located in Panama. Blandone also said that before the U.S. invasion of Grenada in 1983, Vice President Bush asked Noriega to warn Fidel Castro not to intervene. Blandone said Noriega did call Castro. But today, a Bush aide denied that the Vice President had made the request. The big question is whether to believe what Jose Blandone has said. We have with us a believer and a skeptic. The believer is Senator Alphonse D'Amato, Republican of New York and a member of the Senate subcommittee which has been hearing Blandone's testimony. The skeptic is Roger Fontaine, who was the National Security Council specialist on Latin America from 81 to 83. Senator, why do you believe him? Well, the fact of the matter is that we've been dealing with this renegade and this pirate. He was the chief uh, operative that the CIA used, Noriega, for the past 20 years. We've paid him uh, fabulous sums of money, and uh, he's been in our employ up until rather recently. Uh, we've got Admiral Murphy going down just four months ago uh, to meet with him in his private ventures. We've got uh, people, the Drug Enforcement Agency, notwithstanding all of the testimony that comes not only from Blandone, but uh, grand jury indictments, uh, and yet uh, he's pulled the wool over the DEA and they commend him and the Attorney General does for an incredible job. And so we've been out of the loop because we've been so involved as it relates to taking on the problems of Nicaragua, etc that we've been willing to look the other way. And so here he is, he's been trafficking in drugs, trafficking in arms. While he is our operative, while he is our eyes and ears there, here's the same fellow running guns into El Salvador against Duarte, one of our own interests. Why, why it's ludicrous. And so when someone like Mr. Blandone, who really has no access to grind, who comes forward in a good faith effort to set the record straight and to demonstrate how the tentacles of the drug, uh, drug empire and the cartel have taken over, have subverted uh, the military establishments in country after country after country, including Mexico, by the way, mm -hmm. which I guess we'd, we'd say that didn't happen. And Colombia, I imagine that hasn't happened. And of course it's happened in Panama. We still have those people who want to cling on to this that it couldn't possibly. Well, it, it has. These facts are disturbing. 
I think he's very creditable. Uh, yes, uh, one might say now he says that Noriega told him of, a, of a, a phone call, for example, that came from the vice president. The vice president denies it. I believe the vice president. Indeed, the call may not have come from him. It may have come from someone uh, of his staff. But the fact is we've used him to make contacts with Cuba, to make contacts uh, uh, with the Colombians and with others. And, and we've done that even with his predecessor. So it wouldn't be that unusual uh, if he that the call uh, did come. Of huh? course not. And so mm -hmm. now to be outraged and people say, oh, we're, we're skeptical. Now, look, uh, what we're talking about is the fact that we have allowed uh, the drug cartel uh, to take over. And it's not only taken over in Central America, uh, but it's reached right into the tentacles of this country. Just look and see what's happening in our neighborhoods. Let's look and see what's happening in our local police who we find have been corrupted out. And look and see the people who've lost heart. And, and look and see how we are uh, just totally overwhelmed. And so we've never really put a concentrated effort. And the shame of it is that for some misguided reason, we have decided to get in league with the devil because they have offered us a few crumbs, some intelligence at times. They've surrendered some of the cronies who didn't pay them off for their drug protection. And, and, and look what we have. Uh, so, yes, do I believe Mr. Blandone? I think uh, he has attempted to put together a package. He may be out on some of his dates, some of his times. That is one that is accurate, and it's a sorry spectacle. Mr. Fontaine, what questions do you have? Well, first of all, I think uh, that uh, Blandon has been credible in terms of the testimony he's given uh, to the grand jury in Miami. And I think the, the noose is really tightening around General Noriega, who deserves to have that noose tightened. Yeah, it's a result of Blandon's testimony and other testimony. Noriega has now been indicted for That's drug right. trafficking That's and right. money laundering and a lot of other and things. He's, yeah. And all he's right. going to be tried in absentia, and we'll see what happens in terms of the courtroom evidence, but it doesn't look, for, for ver, look very good for Noriega right now. But some of the other things do disturb me, the allegations about uh, NSC, CIA documents uh, on political intelligence regarding uh, members of the Senate. Uh, showing up in uh, in Panama are very disturbing, and I, I, and I think they're political fiction. Political fiction. Political fiction. Why do you say right. that? Because it does ju just just does not ring ring right at all. Not only is it morally wrong, it's illegal for the CIA to do anything like that. It's been categorically denied. Secondly, in terms of the NSC, the NSC is not a political intelligence arm. It's a staff uh, for the President of the United States. Uh, I would, uh, if there is a follow-up, and I assume there will be, ask some very probing questions about about these documents, what they look like, whose uh, signatures were on them, exactly what they were like. Because Bondone himself may think they've been the, that. Uh, things like that can be fabricated. As far as classified is concerned, anybody with a rubber stamp can classify things. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Bondone may be the victim of, of, of Noriega's own uh, Deception. What about the Bush phone call to Noriega about uh, Grenada well, and Castro? I was, I was at the NSC at the time, mm -hmm. and I was involved in, the, in that operation. Uh, I never heard of anything like that uh, at the time, and I was right there. Secondly, it makes no sense. Uh, you don't need Noriega or anybody else to uh, send Castro a message if a, uh, if, if a message were, were to was be sent. Was like a message like that go to Castro, do you know? Uh, as a matter of fact, it did, but it didn't go through Noriega. Where did, how did it go? It came uh, right after the operation started. It went to uh, USINT, that is the U.S. interest section in mm -hmm. Havana. That and is they, our interest section in Havana. And, and the message to Castro was, look, so, uh, our folks are there. Well, you tell me. Well, I can't recall. In right. fact, it's probably still classified, so I won't. But I will tell you the message I won't tell anybody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, Noriega wasn't needed as a cutout. And uh, Noriega, frankly, in, in a lot of people's belief at the time, including mine, was that he as a source of intelligence wasn't very good and as a useful conduit to Castro wasn't needed. Mm -hmm. What about the senator's point that the conduct of the U.S. government generally toward Noriega was shameful and that these morsels of intelligence or little, few little things that we, that we got just weren't worth it? This well, I, agree. With I, the I, I agree with that estimate and there was a debate, I think. Uh, I know there was a debate within uh, the U.S. government at the time as how valuable Noriega was or the Panamanian uh, intelligence system was in terms of telling us what was going on in Central America. I, I saw that stuff, and I didn't think it was particularly helpful. Nor did I think, and I think most people agreed, too, that he was no bridge between us and Fidel. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to send a message, we'd use uh, other intermediaries. But remember, General Noriega is a very good self-inflator of his own role in these things, and uh, his own words and his own aides' words, who may have been copying from what Noriega said at the time, are, are to be discounted.
Yeah. Senator, what about the question that Mr. Fontaine raised about the veracity of these documents and the authenticity of them? Oh, you know, I, I think that Roger probably makes a point, uh, not so much about the authenticity, but I think probably a bunch of scrapbook uh, collections that anybody could have cut out of a newspaper put together by some CIA operative, low level, who was dealing with Noriega over the years. And you've got to understand, here's a man they've been paying $200,000 a year to. I mean, if he wasn't worth anything, when were we going to wake up and say, my God, this is a joke, this is a travesty? And so um, you've got somebody who says, well, this is the head, our head guy down there, and they're giving him a tough time. And so someone probably put together some clips, a, bun a bunch of clips and things yeah. and whatnot and that were classified so, so as to show. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think we've got to look at that, and I agree, agree with Roger. Um, uh, but I want to tell you, Jose Blandon did not make this up, nor did he make up the fact that uh, Noriega called him in the morning at 4.30. I am certain that Noriega got him up at 4.30 and said that he had gotten a call and someone called him. And uh, and he then reached out, got the Cuban intelligence people. They got Fidel to call uh, Noriega. And it, now, who it was? If the vice president says he didn't do it, I, I believe it. But he indicates Noriega says that, that someone called him. Maybe it was a, a some low-level staffer uh, attempting to get another line through into the, into the Cubans. So I, I don't find that uh, difficult to believe. As a matter of fact, I think it fits in. If you see what's taken place right down to recently, I mean, Murphy going there four months ago. It's Admiral, identify Admiral Murphy. Well, Admiral Murphy was the former head of the U.S. Drug Task Force. The vice president had him working right. down there. Right. I mean, what an absolute, he ought to be ashamed of himself. A former admiral of the United States going down to see a drug dealer, telling him don't worry and sending messages. What was he going down with Tonson Park and a bunch of other lobbyists? I mean, now that's the kind of thing that we were doing, and it doesn't make sense. Don't go away, gentlemen. Robin? We look at all this next from the perspective of the intelligence community. George Carver spent 26 years with the CIA, retiring in 1979 after serving in several high-level agency posts, including Deputy Director for National Intelligence. He's now a senior fellow at the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies. Mr. Carver, what do you think of Blandon's credibility? Well, I think that much of what he said, particularly the grand jury, may indeed be accurate, but I also think, <clears throat> Robin, that he's gilding the lily, and I respectfully disagree with the senator in saying that he has no axe to grind. I think that he was fired by Noriega. He's disaffected. I think also he may well be trying to stake out a position for himself in a post-Noriega Panama and perhaps even a post-Reagan United States and feel that a post-Noriega Panama would certainly have a much more left-leaning orientation than the current one. Therefore, he's attacking all the current devils of the, of, of the Central American left the Reagan administration, in this case the vice president, the CIA, etc. I think it, if George Bush says he did not make such a call, I don't think such a call was made. And if the CIA would depart from its practice and flatly deny uh, the allegations that it passed information on U.S. senators, I'm disposed to believe it. First place, it would have been stupid for them to do it. It would have been, as a French jurist said of the murder of the Duke of Enghien in 1804, c'est it's worse than a crime, it's a mistake. And I think that for the CIA, anybody in the CIA, to have given a foreign government, let alone one like the Panamanians, information on U.S. senators and U.S. congressional staffers, if Judge Webster has the sense that I think he has, he would fry that person in oil. Because it was illegal. It is illegal. Well, among other things, it's illegal, but it's also stupid. Now, you are of the, uh, a little delicate this, but you are of the pre-George Casey CIA. Uh... Are you confident uh, when you look over the CIA since you left? Are you uh, absolutely confident in being as adamant as you are about that? Well, Robin, of course, everything's gone downhill since I left. That goes without saying. But uh, the, uh, I am quite confident on this. Bill Casey may have done some things that in retrospect were foolish, but Bill Casey was not dumb in that respect. And there would have been absolutely no point for anyone in the agency to pass information about U.S. senators and congressional staffers, official information, to Noriega or the Panamanian government. Also, when the CIA, this is the first time, Robin, that I believe the CIA has ever flatly denied something. I think it was a mistake for it to budge off the no comment uh, policy, but that's another question. And I don't think it would have gone out on that kind of a limb if there were a shred of substance in that particular charge of Senor Blandon. Well, why just on a logical basis is Mr. Blandon credible uh, to a pros federal prosecutor 
who will take the unprecedented step of putting evidence before a grand jury and indicting a foreign head of state who's been an ally and friend of this country and not credible on these other allegations. Excuse me, people are not simple. They are complex. The fact that they are incredible on some things does not mean they are necessarily credible on everything. And I think when Blandon got in front of a congressional committee with the Klieg lights and television, he decided to oversell his brief a little bit, and I think he started making charges, which I don't believe he'd made to the prosecutor. I may be in error. And his charges about the vice president and his charges about the agency, I think, were patently false. Many of the other things that he said about Noriega probably were not. Noriega is a very unlovely person and Noriega would richly deserve anything that he got. But I think that those particular charges of Blandon were exaggerations. Of course, those charges are more embarrassing, potentially, if they were true to the United States, than the ones against Noriega's drug activities. And I think that the desire to embarrass the United States was part of Blandon's motive in making those particular charges, or at least to embarrass those portions of the U.S. government that are not popular with the people with whom Blandon, I believe, would like to curry favor in Panama. Come back to the intelligence community, the CIA and, uh, and other parts of the intelligence community that you're so familiar with. Senator Matto says that essentially this country, through its intelligence community, or the worth the intelligence community thought it was getting from Noriega, was willing to look the other way. How do you think about that? Well, I was not involved in Central American affairs, and so I have to speak with the objectivity of ignorance. Please understand that. But I think that you've got to understand that the CIA was in an awkward position. Now, that is, it may have done some very foolish things, but Sen Noriega was the person who was the jefe in Panama. Panama was a country in which we have a number of vital interests, including the canal. There would have had to have been a certain measure of liaison contact and discussion just out of the, for the preservation of U.S. interests. Now, if people went overboard and didn't pay attention to the downside of the equation and started trying to use the Panamanians in ways that they shouldn't have used them, then they made mistakes. But I think that we did find that the real estate in Panama was useful to us, even in prosecuting our activities against drug running in Central America and coming up from South America. And I also think we have to be careful about saying that the CIA paid Noriega $200,000. It may well have been that 200000 or more was paid to the Panamanian government, off of which Noriega siphoned right. some for his personal account. But I think that the charge that the CIA paid him personally or that the U.S. government paid him personally may be also a wild exaggeration. Thank you. Jim? Yes, let's bring uh, Senator D'Amato and Roger Fontaine back into this. What about the $200,000 charge, Senator? Where well, does that come from? Let, let me say this to you. I've had some rather reliable people who who I, uh, I believe have indicated that he has been on the payroll, whether it's through the Panamanian government or whether a private company or whatever the source of the funding might be, the mechanism. I don't have that information. And uh, I've been told that they paid him in about, about $200,000 a year. I don't only believe it. It's a fact. It and but the be. CIA money? Well, well, well there, again, the payments were arranged and set up and, and the manner in which Mr. Carver could tell you the different manners in which these things are conducted. But uh, the fact of the matter is he was the person who we relied upon and he was well paid. And this wasn't 200000 over 20 years. This was $200,000 a year that, that, that he received. Now, that's, that's information I received from from reliable sources. What about his overall point, though, that he thinks Blandon is overselling his brief, and he's got motives that relate to his own political aspirations back in Panama? You know, up until um, about three weeks ago, Blandon was attempting to do whatever he could to work out a peaceful transference um, of power, and I think his plan was, uh, was a good plan to attempt to ease the situation and provide for a transition. And when finally he ran into the wall, as he said, which, which was not Noriega himself, but Noriega and his associates in the drug cartel and all of those who weren't provided for in that plan, why well, he had uh, no other recourse but then to, to either keep quiet, and he could have had his uh, very lush job and kept it as counsel general in New York, he could have done that, or move forward and do something, and he did. And he was reluctant to do that because he understands uh, that you're talking about desperate people in a desperate situation, and, and so he's taken a high risk, a high risk as it relates to his own personal safety, and certainly one which is aimed at attempting to change the political equation there. Mr. Carver? Well, let's be a little careful there, with all due respect to the senator. Blandon put out a plan which, had it worked, would have left Blandon in a very advantageous position. Blandon has personal aspirations. Noriega fired him. And he may well, as I say, be you mean the plan, the political, the, the political, the political plan, plan would have right. deposed Noriega, and they would have looked for somebody neutral 
unacceptable to all sides to take over an interim basis, and guess who that might have been? You, you know, let, let me make one point, George. We're not talking about one isolated plan, one isolated. We're talking about major events where uh, Blandone, as the political analyst and intelligence analyst, and as the specialist, was called in repeatedly over a period of years by Noriega for his help when he first had a problem with the Colombian drug cartel. And we know that. We know what took place. Mm -hmm. They went in there. They had made an agreement. They broke the agreement. Um, um, he, was, he got the word that there was a hit team out for him, he being Noriega. Who does he send for? Blandone. And he says, go down to Cuba. He goes, if you doubt that, let's say it. But I want to tell you, with specificity, he goes through details of how Castro told him and how he carries it on. Again, a uh, following year, he goes through with specificity, and he says, when this uh, invasion in Grenada took place, Noriega, Noriega called him, said to him, yeah. make the contact. I mean, so, I want to tell you something. I do not believe that, uh, and, unless I've really been taken in, a man will sit down with a comportment, etc., that Jose Blandone has to outline this and indicate that which he knew for fact and that which was told to him. Look, I don't doubt, deny for a minute that Blendon has been a very close associate of Noriega. I think that Blendon sees that Noriega's ship is sinking, and he's trying to jump to another ship. And I think that in that process, to work his passage over to another ship, he's quite capable of making charges that make him look good by attacking what? people who are disliked by those with whom he now wants to curry favor. You're shaking your head in agreement with George Carver? Uh, basically, yes. Uh, a, uh, Blendon was, was a close political advisor. He is among a circle of close civilian political advisors to Noriega and Torrijos before Noriega. They are not, by the way, pro-American. They're very much anti-American. Uh, of course, he's looking to his own future. Uh, yes, if Nor Noriega steps down, there's going to be an election next year. He hopes uh, to be at least one of the candidates and perhaps be the next president of Panama. All right. Well, I, th I think that that is far-fetched, and Mr. Blandone will be the, one of the first to tell you that his political party has absolutely uh, a very limited popularity. And what we're seeing here is, a, is an attempt to poke holes through someone without really substantively coming forth with any areas where he's given any misinformation, because right. he has not. But All he may right, think gentlemen. if he takes on the CIA and the Reagan administration, his popularity will increase. Well, let me tell you, the CIA uh, for having this go. crook and this low life on the pad deserves to be Senator taken on. Mr. Carver, Mr. Fontaine, thank you. Robin.